so we'll, we'll lead off in terms of, uh, Cheryl, what's your perspective on when should a complaint become an, an investigation? Well, first of all, I wanted to just say hi to everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, there was really no pressure when I heard there was 100 people signed up. I just about had a heart attack, but um, that's awesome. So, you know, the first question is, you know, when should something become an investigation? And as a happily retired lawyer, my answer will be, well, it depends. <laughs> so those of you who know me, uh, that is my uh, standard 10 answer. And so why, why do I say that is because not everything um, is an investigation. And so I think, uh, you know, as HR folks and as investigators, uh, you know, we have to be sort of cognizant of that in the sense of that we're not going from A to Z in two nanoseconds, right? We have to make sure that that is the right process for someone who wants resolution to whatever's happening in the workplace. So what I'd like to recommend is like a triage system, you know, for the internal folks and employers, you know, to look at, you know, what, what is going on? Um, how can we maybe resolve this? What's gonna work for the party that's coming forward? And to make sure that in your workplace, respectful workplace policy, um, your harassment policy, that you have some type of informal options. Because, you know, in, in my sort of experience, which is, you know, as you heard, a very long time, um, you know, it, it, I would say probably 60% of our investigations turn into uh, some informal type of resolution. And, um, you know, one case that we just did where uh, the person came and said, you know, here's my concern of what's going on in the workplace. I'm not being treated very well. And, um, they right away went into an investigation, went into an external investigation. And when we when we actually first talked to the complainant, they said, I don't I don't know why I'm here. Like I this is not what I wanted. So we, we need to make sure that it is an investigation. You know, there are situations in the workplace that are serious and egregious. And we all know that we have to do our due diligence as employers. So we need to assess whether or not uh, you know, it is a proper investigation whether we need to go down that path. So, so you mentioned, Cheryl, you know, bringing in an external source uh, in, in that circumstance. So, so what is the trigger point in terms of bringing somebody in externally versus dealing with it solely internally? Well, I mean, there, there's a few reasons. Uh, one, is bad, one is usually bandwidth, right? Is that, you know, internal HR folks and the HR department just doesn't have the time or you know the energy to do it, and so you know they will outsource it. Um, I deal with clients who outsource all their investigations; they just don't even want to do them um, because of the potential risk and liability that could be attached. Right? Um, you know, obviously the complexity of a case. Uh, a lot of clients that we have, you know, do do them if if. If it's, you know, if it's sort of the C-suite or upper management, right? So if it's sort of above the HR department, um, then, it, it, then it's an external investigator. And also too, you know, whether or not you have people trained in your organization to be able to do that. And that's like a huge, huge thing to consider whether people have the proper training. Okay, interesting. And, you know, can you help us understand a little bit about some of the ways that workplaces can, can actually help people understand the process, some of the communication mechanisms, some of the things that need to happen for a successful outcome? Well, I think it all goes back to sort of communication and training and do people know what, you know, what the viable options are, right? And what options do they have? Um, because if people think that they only can do an investigation, that's all they're probably going to ask for. But I think it goes down to sort of, you know, what is the conversation that you're having with this person and what are their expectations around what's going to happen? And I think that, you know, um, internal folks need to spend time with people who come forward to, you know, like I was just talking about sort of that triage, right, to find out what is going to work for them, what's going to resolve this for, for them in the workplace, how are they going to feel better in the workplace, you know, and so it just comes down to that conversation and do they understand the outcome, you know, like I would say more, you know, more chances than not when we meet with people, um, they don't understand where all this can go, right, and where it can go, it could go to court, <laughs> And, you know, I mean, not to scare complainants off, right? We don't want people not to make uh, complaints, you know, to us. 
but you know they need to understand the full sort of scale of where this can go and what it involves right and you know a lot of complainants sometimes uh, think that you know when they go to HR and they spill their story and you know they breathe a sigh of relief that it's over right that HR is going to believe them and then you know uh, you know the world is all going to be good and everyone lives happily ever after and uh, you know and so we hear that sometimes is that well I went to HR and I told them and so why am I doing this with you now and so people don't understand the full sort of extent of what an investigation is. And I think that is like a really important conversation for uh, HR folks to have with people who come forward with complaints. And, and oh, oh, go ahead, Dean, yeah. Just, just on that, how much do you share with the, the, the parties involved in terms of findings or status in the process, assuming that it takes more than, you know, a, a half a day, a day, and, and it carries on through multiple days. So I always, I always err on the, on the side of transparency. So, you know, my job as an external investigator, um, and your job as an internal investigator is to be neutral and to be fair, right? And to always adhere to due process. Otherwise, you know, we might get in trouble and get our hands slapped. Um, so, you know, we want to make sure that, um, you know, that people understand, you know, who, who, who we are and what we're doing and what the, ex you know, what the whole thing is. And so going back to transparency is, you know, you know, does the complainant know what the process is? Were they given a choice to do like an alternative res uh, dispute resolution option? Um, do they know where it can end up? And, you know, one of the things on the complainant end is that some complainants don't understand that their complaint or their concerns or their allegations need to go to the respondent. And so that's one of the biggest uh, sort of omissions that I see, um, you know, with, with our internal processes is that that, that complaint or those allegations do not go to the respondent directly. Um, so we are not in, like, we're not uh, like in a court, right? We're not here to trip people up. We're trying to get a story, right? And so, you know, the respondent needs to know what the allegations are, who is making these allegations, because they need to be entitled to be uh, given the time to respond accordingly. And um, so that's one of the biggest, biggest things I see that doesn't happen in internal processes is, and we call that the sneak attack. <laughs> and so um, I don't recommend the sneak attack because I mean, we're just trying to get a story. We're trying to get to the bottom of what happened, right? Or as close to uh, what happened as we can. And so in order to do that, we need to be transparent with the information, right? And so, you know, a lot of complainants get scared uh, when, you know, when you tell them, well, we have to share this information with the person you're accusing, uh, you know, that, you know, you're saying who did something or said something to you that made you feel uncomfortable. Um, and I think it just goes down to, um, again, sort of the communication, the transparency about the process and who you are in the process, right? And what you're trying to achieve. You're trying to achieve some kind of resolution, some kind of closure for this person that is going to make, you know, going to make this workplace better for them. Yeah, great. I've, I've got a question via chat here. Um, in HR, we often get employees not want to follow through with an investigation, but as employers, we now have a responsibility to follow up because we are aware. Is, is this correct? Yes, it is correct. Um, so as we all probably know, for those of us who live in BC and for those of us who live in other provinces, provinces that have work safe, uh, workers' compensation, or occupational uh, safety legislation, um, you know, we now as employers have to do investigations, have to look into things that come up. And so, you know, again, like for me, it's always, you know, you never wanna sort of like push someone into doing something that they're not comfortable with, right? But as the employer, you know, we have to have that conversation to say, listen, you know, we have a mandate to do this. You know, and, and, and from the complainant's end, it's like when complainants come forward, it's usually because they want something done. And, uh, you, know, un you know, unfortunately for some complainants, you know, you have to be involved in the process. 
in order for that for some change to happen. And so, you know, so there are some complaints who will say, no, absolutely not. I don't want to do this. And, um, you know, in those circumstances, you know, there are, you know, there's, se there's several options, right? Um, you know, you can either as a, as an employer, sort of keep an eye on the situation. If it's not serious, if it, there's no violence involved, if it doesn't involve a lot of people in your workplace, um, keeping an eye on it, checking in with your complainant all the time. Um, the second one is if it is serious and it is egregious, um, you can take it out of the complainant's hand and you as an employer can do the investigation. So, so really it's kind of like the employer becomes the complainant. Uh, because you have, uh, you know, you have a mandate, you have due diligence that you need to do as an invest uh, as an employer. Um, the other thing too that you can do is uh, what we call workplace assessment. There's lots of names for it, climate assessment, environmental scan. Um, and that's where, you know, you're not sort of pointing the finger at the respondent, but you're trying to figure out like what's going on in this workplace. If it affects or involves uh, more people than the complainant without the complainant having to come forward and saying, you know, this is what the respondent is doing in the workplace and it's infect infecting, affecting <laughs> more people than me, right? So, you know, so there, there are different options, but, you know, I think the bottom line is yes, as employers, we are mandated to look into situations because for those of us who have had some contact with WorkSafe, um, you know, they're going to say, what have you done about this, right? And if you haven't done anything, you know, you could be uh, facing a compliance order, which, you know, none of us want. No. Um, Cheryl, there's another question in the chat. Sometimes the complainant doesn't want to share the information with the respondent as they don't feel safe. As a result, I've had a senior leader outside the investigation provide coaching to the respondent. Thoughts? Uh, Sorry, so the complainant has made a complaint but doesn't want to sort of go forward. So instead, we've the senior leader is now coaching the respondent. Coaching the respondent, to, yeah. yeah. So in, yeah, I mean, I, th I think that's great. As long as that is going to satisfy the complainant in the sense of is the behavior changing or has it changed? And is it making, you know, a better workplace for the complainant? I think that's great. I mean, that's a great informal option, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I had a just a follow up uh, question to the, something you were just saying a little bit ago. So, um, so any tips on how to um, how to lead up in organizations? So where we where we know that we're responsible as an employer to conduct the investigation, but um, we're maybe getting some pressure from senior leaders who don't want an investigation. They're, they're, they want to just sweep it under the carpet. Oh, I know him or, or oh, I know her and it's not a big deal. And right, like, and they, they don't want you to investigate. Do you have any suggestions about just how to coach up in, the, in a situation like that? Um, that's like a loaded question. <laughs> so, uh, you know, if I was the HR folk uh, person, you know, getting that sort of instructions uh, from the senior leader, um, you know, I would try and have a conversation about, you know, why we need to do this again, sort of communication. Um, you know, if that's not, I mean, cause it goes down to, you know, risk management and liability, right? And if you, I mean, we don't have an option anymore not to do anything, right? We have to do something. We can't bury our heads in the sand anymore. And, um, you know, my first thought was, well, I don't know, do you want, really want to work there? <laughs> so if those are the instructions you're getting from your senior leadership, but, you know, to me, that means that your senior leadership is, uh, doesn't have the information that they should have um, to be able to sort of chime in on these conversations. And so, I, I mean, you know, what can you do except document, right? Mm -hmm. Document, document, document. And um, I mean, if something, you know, if something happens, if something goes down and, you know, S-I-H-I-T hits the fan, then, you know, at least you're going to, you're going to have something. And um, so, I, I mean, it's, it's a tough situation to be in. Um, but I would hope, you know, that nowadays uh, people are a little bit more savvy. I don't know. Right. So, um, you know, I, I think it's, you know, the information that, you know, does your leadership team have the adequate information 
that they need. And of course, you know, that always comes from the top, right? So is it coming down? So. Can you, can you share with us, Cheryl, from your experiences, some of the most common pitfalls or, or mistakes that you've seen uh, organizations make uh, within this process? Yeah, and I think that I sort of touched on a few of them already, Dean. Um, you know, like one of the things that you always have to consider is, you know, sort of at the top of the list is due process, right? Are we treating the parties the same? Are we treating them any differently, right? And, um, you know, so I, you, you have to be careful that, um, you know, that whatever you're doing with the complainant, that you're giving ample opportunity to the respondent to respond, right? Because um, again, you know, like I said before, you know, our role is to get the story, to try and find out what happened. And if, you know, if there's a breach of your policy or the collective agreement or law, you know, we want to know about it as employers, right? So we can deal with it. You know, I always say uh, that, you know, when a, when a person comes into your office and tells you about something or uh, tells you about allegations, you know, it's a gift. It doesn't seem like a gift at the time because you're thinking, great, I got to do more work. But, you know, the thing is, it's better to know than not to know and it blow up at the end of the day and that person leaves and all of a sudden you've got, you know, a court case, you've got work safe, you've got employment standards, you got the human rights tribunal. Um, you know, it's, it's better to, um, to know and to have the opportunity to, to resolve it. So, you know, just going back to due process, right? Are we giving people the chance to respond? Are we giving the people a chance to say their story in the sense of, you know, are we meeting with people? Are we giving them a chance to talk about what happened? Are we meeting with all the people who can give us the information, you know, uh, i.e. witnesses? Um, so, you know, we see investigations where all the relevant, relevant, and we have to talk about that, but maybe not here, but, you know, like, are we talking to the people who can give us the information about what happened in this situation? Um, so, you know, we have to be careful about, uh, about that. And also, you know, that we're not sort of jumping to a conclusion or prejudging the situation before we actually do an investigation. And sometimes I know that's a challenge uh, in internal investigations because you know you might know these people, you might know their reputation. You know, does that, does that impact uh, the way that you're conducting your investigation? So we have to be careful of, of, about that, right? And so, you know, and sometimes that's hard, right? So, but we have to be cognizant that that could be a factor at play. And, um, you know, like, I think, you know, the thing and like we talked about, you know, sort of the sneak attacks. No, we don't want sneak attacks, right? There's no purpose in having a sneak attack. Um, you know, you can have your thoughts about, you know, maybe who this respondent is or, you know, what their what their history has been with the company. But if we're doing an investigation, we have to have a fair investigation. Right. And so, you know, um, there's lots of cases that are now coming before the courts about flawed uh, investigations, right? And so we need to be careful. And there's cases out there that, you know, that basically say, um, you know, like if you don't do a fair investigation, if you have bias in the investigation, that's gonna cost your employer uh, probably a lot of money in legal fees and a lot of time, right? When it didn't have to be like that, right? So just uh, being careful that, you know, that that stuff doesn't happen. So, you know, do we have, you know, a complaint? Do we have a response? Have we given them proper time for interviews to give us the information that we need? Have we interviewed the witnesses? Um, and have we prepared a report that basically sets out um, you know, the decision and how we got there, right? You, you, you briefly kind of touched on, you know, the potential consequence or the liability that exists as an employer. Can, can you talk to us a little bit more about that, whether it's, it's work safe, whether it's human rights, uh, the legal fees, and, and, and truly what is the potential liability organizationally, both from a, a dollars and cents standpoint, as, as well as a, a, a potential publicity standpoint, uh, internal culture, uh, anything else? Geez, that's a lot of questions, Dean. <laughs> that's one of the things that I teach in our course about uh, asking questions and asking one at a time. So, um, but yeah. Uh, 
<laughs> because guess guess who guess what guess which one I'll answer the first one yep. or the last one. Um, so yeah, so uh, you know there is liability if we don't do it if we don't a do an investigation or b don't do it great right. So the courts don't don't um, expect you to do a perfect investigation. You just have to do the best investigation that you can do and a fair investigation. So, um, you know, but there are some circumstances where, you know, people who are, um, you know, ha who have more information uh, will do everything at once in the sense of, you know, going to the HR to, you know, file a complaint who want an investigation, who will go to WorkSafe to file a claim, a complaint, a prohibited action claim, right? Uh, who will go to the human rights code, who will go to employment standards, uh, who will go to a whole bunch of things, right? Like that they, they have a right to do, that they have a right to um, access. And guess what? The employer has to deal with all of those situations. And I've dealt with a few in my career. And let me tell you, it is a nightmare for employers to have to, you know, juggle all of those things. Plus, you know, write the check. Um, you know, to, to usually their lawyer who is, you know, dealing with all those situations. Um, you know, like, obviously we don't, we don't, and that's why I try to encourage employers, you know, to try and handle things, you know, but, it, but, but it's a bigger play picture or picture play in the sense of, you know, what is the culture of your workplace, right? If, if the culture is, yeah, we can bring it to HR and it's gonna get resolved and, you know, we're gonna do a mediation or investigation, um, you know, that, that, that's great. But if the culture is such that people aren't coming forward and not feeling comfortable, not feeling safe to be able to come forward, then that's when you see these people who will go outside and it is their right, right? It's their right to do that. So, um, you know, but if we, if we're creating a culture in our workplace that allows people to feel comfortable coming forward and allowing us as the employer to um, hopefully resolve the issue, then we won't see it going to all of those places. Can it cost a lot of money? Yeah, it can cost a lot of money, right? For, so for those of you, you know, who hire external investigators, you know, an investigation is like probably minimum $5,000. And it can go up to, you know, like we, we've had a, we had a case which was very like, you know, there were a lot of people, the report was a hundred pages, <gasps> um, you know, and it was like a lot of money, like, you know, and um, if it goes, you know, that's just the investigation, right? If it then goes to, to court for, you know, wrongful dismissal, constructive dismissal, well, you know, like, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't doubt that it's like six figures. So, you know, can, can we put that money somewhere else in our organization in the sense of, you know, training our folks or, you know, creating programs that can help them feel better in, in their workplace? Sure. But, you know, uh, you know, it, it be, you know, there's some cases that happen that you, you just can't prepare for. Right. Right. And then the time on top of that, Cheryl, I'll just add to, to that, like the, the situation, the one, my one situation that I was personally involved in uh, two and a half years. And uh, and counting is is what we're we're into here. So the yeah. the civil stuff is taken care of, but because um, it went the civil route first, but but now there's a criminal investigation and it's nowhere near done. Yeah. A uh, question from the chat: uh, Are there credentials that people must have to do investigations in the workplace? Oh, that is a great question. That is a million dollar question. Let, my answer is, I wish there was. <laughs> um, there is not, there is no regulatory body for uh, workplace investigators. Um, so, you know, what my recommendation is, is that you get some really good uh, training. Uh, there are a lot of, well, I shouldn't say, a, there's a lot, there's a, you know, a few uh, places out there that you can get training, um, you know, who will give you some credentials. Um, you know, some are, some are approved by CPHR, some are approved by, you know, the Law Society, uh, but doing your research as to, you know, where you should get that training, but definitely have some training um, behind your belt, because especially to, uh, you know, like I think that looks good on your resume if you're, if you're an internal HR person, 
um, because I'm sure that's going to be part of your roles and responsibilities. And, you know, and as an external, you know, that's going to gonna, gonna look good on your resume as well as, you know, clients want to know where did you get your training? What kind of training did you have? Um, so, you know, and just because, you know, you're a lawyer um, and not just like lawyers at all, but just because you're a lawyer, because you're a lawyer, it doesn't make you an investigator. Same thing as, as an HR, po uh, HR person. If you're an HR person, doesn't necessarily mean you're an investigator. So just making sure that we have some training, but for the credential part, we don't have them yet. Um, I'm in a group uh, that's working sort of on that, like, but it is a, it's gonna be a long road. Another question in the chat here, aside from asking witnesses open-ended questions, do you have any powerful questions for witnesses to share that, that really help tell the story? What are some of your favorite powerful questions to get people to open up? Uh, so if we're talking about witnesses, sometimes witnesses are reluctant to participate because, you know, they don't want to rat out their coworker or throw someone under the bus. And so, you know, I'm, I'm always sort of keen on having a conversation with people about, um, you know, about my role and about what an investigation is. And really it's about like, we're here because there's something wrong. So there's a problem in the workplace. Right. And so if I can't, get the information, you know, great information uh, from people, then, you know, I'm, I, I might not make the best decision, which may not lend itself to changing the workplace. So, you know, I mean, witnesses are, it depends, like if you're dealing with like, say an eyewitness, obviously you're going to just, you know, ask them, what did you see? What happened that day? Um, you know, tell me about it, right? And so get them to tell their story. But then, you know, if they have, if they've been named as an eyewitness, you can just say, well, you know, the complainant said you were there that day and you were standing here. And so what happened, right? And so, you know, then just funneling down. But I, 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 I always want to make sure that the witness feels comfortable in what they're doing. And, you know, and again, what this process is about, right? Because witnesses sometimes don't understand that they can be a witness, not just for, for the investigation, but for other processes. Um, so in the investigation that we do, uh, we give witnesses, except managers, <laughs> uh, we give witnesses anonymity. So we will say you have anonymity for the purposes of this investigation. And I, I tend to think that that allows the person, not that they're gonna like, then think, woo, excellent. Like I'm gonna really throw this person under the bus, but they're gonna say, okay, well, it, it feels like I have some protection, right? Um, so, but being aware that they could be called it as a witness in another proceeding at some point. So I, th I think it's just, you know, A, making sure that they're comfortable, that they understand why they're there um, and the purpose of, of the investigation. Also, you know, whether or not they have anonymity and that depends on your organization and the, your procedures, um, you know, but, uh, you know, like I, I always like to say that witnesses are on a need to know basis, right? They don't need to know every single detail of the investigation. Sometimes they don't even get to know the, the people who are involved, like the complainant and the respondent, because if you're looking for information on you know, culture in the workplace or in the department, um, they're not going to need to know who that is. If they're an eyewitness or if they've been named as a pro appropriate witness by the complainant or respondent, well, then, you know, you might have to disclose a little bit more information. I don't know. Did that help? Cheryl, I have a follow-up question to that. I know you are passionate about and uh, also provide training around a trauma-informed approach. What is, in a nutshell, if you can, a trauma-informed approach and why is that important? That's a big nutshell, Ken. I know, I know. <laughs> um, so trauma-informed approach uh, has been around a long time. So for those of us who come from sort of a, you know, counseling or social service background, um, you know, it's always been around. So, uh, you know, but what we like to say is that an investigator needs to be trauma-informed. So if you don't have trauma-informed training, you need to get it. And so what is trauma-informed approach, trauma-informed practice? So basically what it is in a nutshell <laughs> is that, you know, we need to take into account that there has been a lot of trauma in people's lives and, or some trauma. And we, and it, it may, it may come out 
uh, in an investigation. It may even come out in your first interview as an HR person, uh, you know, with the complainant or the respondent or a witness. Like you never know what can trigger folks, right? Um, so you just need to be aware um, that trauma exists in your workplace with your complainant and your respondent and how you're going to approach this person, right? So, you know, without going into too much detail, you know, like if we know that there's trauma and usually like if you're trained in tr the trauma-informed approach, you will see it pretty early on, right? There's indicators. Um, and uh, like I do a lot of sexual assault investigations. And so, you know, I, I see a lot of trauma, right? And so, you know, how do you, how do you deal with that? And, um, you know, what, what are the things that you do around it? So like, I mean, you know, some of the basic uh, sort of tips, if you're doing an investigation interview, when your complainant walks in, you know, with their support person or whatever, you say, where would you like to sit? Right, because you're, you're, we're, we're trying to create a safe place for them. And our role as an HR person or as investigator is not to re-traumatize this person. Right. And so how do we do that? So it, it, it is a big topic and I would highly encourage uh, people to um, get some training on that. Um, so I, I'm sorry, but it's just such a big topic. No, that's that's even that's that's great, Cheryl. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, certainly many of us have have seen um, and maybe even been caught a bit off guard when some of that trauma shows up in the middle, like especially with, you know, when I think about witnesses as well, like sometimes it's it's really obvious when in, when somebody's, you know, been um, victimized within, you know, as part of it, that's what the investigation is about. But then in chatting with the witnesses, sometimes it's I, I, I know that's happened to me, even though I've had training. Right. Like it's just kind of like, oh, OK like okay <laughs> we need to dial things back here so this this person's going through something here this yeah. has triggered something a, a question from the chat cheryl and i know this question comes from camlets because you certainly do uh, training in, in Kelowna. but is is there any third-party training that you would recommend in in uh, you know and i i believe this question would be geared towards camlets specifically knowing that you do some of the training in, in Kelowna. Uh, well, I don't know anyone who's doing in-person training now. Um, so, uh, you know, like you said, we do training and we have online training courses. I know you're not supposed to plug, but that was kind of like a lead into a plug. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 you know, how frequently do you provide those? And, and is there a, a resource that you could provide or, or we could follow up afterwards so people could understand what courses you offer? Well, I, yeah, I think I think Candace is going to send an email and um, with a special code for all you special folks who are here today. <laughs> so thanks. Thanks for letting me uh, talk about that. But yeah, we I mean, we usually do the training um, like every, you know, two, three, four weeks. It just depends on, you know, how many people are asking for it. Um, so we do it. We do it quite a bit. So check it out. Great. Another question from the chat. Um, I heard someone recently share that when they do the bullying and harassment training, they really focus on the witness component as it makes the bulk of the staff. What is their role and how do they support a positive culture? Uh, the witness? Witnesses? Correct. Correct. Like, a, like, a by, like we're talking about bystander stuff. Um, you know, I, I think... Uh, employees in the workplace are like any employee in the workplace is important because you know we all sort of participate we all have to take a part in this right and so you know and i think it's sort of the culture that we've been brought up in in the sense of you know you shouldn't narc on anyone like you shouldn't bring anything forward right and so uh you know so again it's going going to the culture i mean you know worksafe has even gone so far as saying um, you know, you have, you have a mandate as a, as a worker to report, right? And uh, so I, I don't know what the, what the reality of that is, but, you know, my hope in sort of changing this culture that we've been sort of, uh, you know, that we've had to buy into for many, many years is, um, you know, things aren't going to change in a workplace unless we speak up about it. 
you know, and, you know, thanks to, you know, hashtag me too movement and hash, you know, the, the black, Ma black lives matter movement, you know, people are feeling more comfortable speaking up. And so I think that's really, you know, what it comes down to are people, you know, comfortable speaking up. Um, and it, it's really not, it shouldn't be viewed as against someone. It should be to make a respectful workplace, to make a healthy and safer, you know, workplace. And so I, I think it's just changing that culture in the sense of it's okay to speak up because uh, we want change, right? We want change so that we work in a workplace that is a great place to work, right? So that we feel good and happy going to work. And so, you know, I, I would say that witnesses are important or, you know, any, any employer or any employee in the workplace is important. And what is the role that they're prepared to play in these situations that might come up? What, one of the classics, and I'm sure you've dealt with this many times, is the, the he said, she said. So mm -hmm. can, can you walk us through the, the best way to, to navigate that dynamic? Yeah, and I mean, they, you know, those those situations happen all the time, right? And so that comes back, it comes down to an assessment of credibility, right? Who's more credible? Um, who's more believable? Whose story is more plausible? And so that, so then we, when we look at sort of, you know, what, it, you know, you know, our test is the balance of probabilities, right? So, you know, as most of us know, it's like 50.01. So, you know, whose who's story is 0.01 more believable than the other. Um, like in my training, I, I always say, I like to say, you know, I usually go for about like 60, 70% because I want to be on like that big side of the scale, um, you know, but, but really well, like we're looking at their stories, right? And whose story makes more sense? Does one, is one story, is there a corroboration to one story? Um, you know, do we have some, you know, documentary evidence? Do we have witness evidence that corroborates their story more than the other one, right? So we're looking at, um, you know, you know, whose story uh, looks better, right? It is better. And um, like, who do we believe, right? And we have to look at some of the factors that go into that. And so, you know, some of the things, well, we call them, they call them deception factors, right? And so for any of any of you folks who have studied that, it's really interesting, right? And, um, you know, so there's, you know, deception factors in what we say, what we do, how we look, um, but we can't always, like if someone's like sitting like this and their eyes are down or, you know, they're not, like we can't, we can't just say because of Cheryl's body language, it, it was very clear she was lying. Um, because it's not just about that, because there's lots of reasons people do things physically, right? You know, like most people are scared, uncomfortable when they come to an investigation interview, right? Yeah. So, you know, so for people not to look at you or arms crossed, like maybe I'm cold, like who knows, right? So there's lots of different things that go to credibility. And um, those are the things that we need to look at as an investigator, because our job is to make a decision right, is to say, did it happen or did it not happen, right, the allegation, and, you know, is there a breach of the policy or collective agreement or both, right, so, you know, we have to, you know, like, when I was first starting out, probably, like, halfway through, you know, it was okay to say, well, it's, it's unsubstantiated because there's a lack of evidence, that was, that was okay, it's not okay now, right, we have to make a decision, and, and really, it's the best decision that we can make based on the evidence that we've been given. Um, credibility can certainly drift into, uh, you know, a, a reasonable uh, or, or a reasonable or an unreasonable person. So can you talk to us a little bit about the, that definition um, and how you deal with it? Yeah, who is this reasonable person? <laughs> Is it you? Is it me? <laughs> Who is it? Right. Um, and, you know, that's always an it, it's it's interesting, but that's like our test that we have to adhere to. Right. Ought reasonably to have known. And so, you know, it, it you know, so should they have responded ought reasonably to have known that what they did, you know, could have been offensive or unwelcome or inappropriate to the person that they did it to. 
And so we need to look at what is the current standard in our society. So, uh, you know, so there's a scale, right? And um, so one end of the scale is like, you know, severely egregious, right? Ho like horrible, um, you know, on one side and on the other side is, you know, what's acceptable and the, in the middle is what's reasonable, right? So it's, it, and again, it's not a perfect, it's not a perfect thing. But, you know, you have to be, it has to be, you know, would a reasonable person have been affected like that, right? So what the complainant is complaining about, the allegations that they're making against the respondent, would, you know, would, would a reasonable person have been affected like that? Um, and so sometimes, you know, we, you know, we experience um, people who in, in the workplace who are, you know, ultra sensitive, right? Uh, and that's just the way it is, right? It's ultra sensitive, but is that what a reasonable person would experience, right? And so we have to sort of like look in the middle of that scale, right? And say, what is reasonable? Because uh, like on one side, we have the ultra sensitive person. On one side, we have the person who's like, you could say or do anything, they won't be offended, right? But there has to be something in the middle, right? And that's what we're looking for. And so that's what, you know, that's the test that we're gonna have to apply, um, you know, at the end of the day to say, you know, ought they have reasonably to have known to do that? And would a reasonable person have been affected that way? So it's sort of two, you know, the reasonable person is like sort of two, two sets of standards, right? I have another question in the chat. This is so good, Cheryl. Uh, what's the best way to proceed when the decision internally is not in favor of the complainant, but, uh, and adamant the, the events offenses occurred what is the complainant's options? Um, yeah, and so, you know, that's the thing about investigation, even though, you know, I've been an investigator for 25 years, there's always a winner and there's always a loser, right? But guess what is there at the end of the investigation, at the end of the report, is, uh, when the report has been submitted? The issue still exists, right? The problem may still exist, so now we have a situation that has been compounded by someone losing, right? Uh, and so if the complainant is, is the person who, you know, didn't get the decision that they were thinking they would, right? What happens? Well, the expectation is that complainant needs to go back to the workplace and work with the respondent. So, you know, like I say to clients, you know, yeah, we can do this investigation, but that's step number one because there's a lot of work that you need to do after the fact. And so it sort of goes back to that, you know, um, are there other options for resolution? Because if there are, you're going to get a re resolution. An investigation is not a resolution. It is a process that will give the employer an answer, you know, but it's the after investigation that is very important because uh, if you don't, resolve the situation, um, someone will probably leave the organization. So, you know, so what does that look like? Like in our investigations, um, you know, we're always asked for recommendations and we don't give sort of corrective action investigations or punitive, uh, sort of punitive recommendations, sorry. Um, you know, we're asked for restorative recommendations. And so that might be, um, you know, having mediation or having a facilitated conversation with uh, the complainant and the respondent or whoever may be affected, right? It might be some kind of team training. There might be some policy stuff that needs to be, you know, dealt with. Um, there might need to be some coaching, you know, for the manager on how to deal with this, right? There may need be, to be some, you know, conflict resolution and effective communication training. Um, and so that's what you need to look at. And one of the things that we do um, is that we always have a, a meeting with the client before we submit a report so that they know what our decision is and they have time to plan, right? What the aftercare is in the sense of, okay, how are we gonna deal with this once we let the complainant and the respondent know? Um, so some organizations do have an appeal process so um, in their policy, and so that's an option too. But again, you know, looking at sort of, you know, the end result, right? 
where are we going to be if we go if we keep going through all of this and so you know that's why i always encourage uh hr folks to try and explore with these people uh you know how else can we resolve this and sometimes sometimes that's hard because uh you're dealing with people who are emotional right and when emotions get wrapped up in it we know what all that can look like right and so, um, you know, before, be, before you ever promise an investigation, um, you need to go through all sort of the, uh, you know, other options for informal re resolution and give them some time to think about it. You know, and that might be a discussion, you know, with their union rep or their lawyer or whoever, their, you know, their partner. Um, but like, you know, don't, don't, in, you know, don't make, don't say that we're going to do an investigation. I always encourage sort of exploration of informal options so that we don't, we don't have to worry about that because we're, you know, I always think the ironic thing is that, you know, we can choose informal options and then we don't. So we go through an investigation and then we, are back here, which is the informal resolution stage again. <laughs> so, so if possible, you know, try, try and go down that way. And like, there's nothing sort of inside the box, like think outside the box, like there could be all kinds of resolutions. And I always ask the parties, like, how, how are we going to fix this? How are we going to make this better? You know, and barring, barring the answer, uh, well, I want them fired. Um, I, I mean, I don't hear that very much. So when I don't hear that, I think there's a chance, right, that we can fix this for these these folks. We, we've we've touched a little bit about uh, you know on unreasonable people, reasonable people, uh, the reasonable complaint. Is there such a thing as as the unreasonable complaint or unreasonable allegation? I have to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I I don't really think so. Um, because complainants really feel when they come forward and they've made a complaint that they have been wronged, that they have been harmed. And so who, who are we to say that's not right, right? Um, I have rarely seen a complaint where it is malicious or vexatious. Um, like I would, I, I think maybe like two complaints out of the 25 years that I've been doing this, right? And too many investigations that I've done, but, you know, uh, but did they truly believe that this happened? They did, but then they sort of bolstered their case with all this other stuff that was extraneous and uh, vexatious, right? So I, I think it's, you know, maybe unreasonable is, you know, is it malicious or vexatious, right? And if that if that's the case, that that's a real problem for the employer. But I I mean, we don't see it very much um, in the external investigation world. Um, but it, you know, uh, as an employer, I would look really uh, critically at a complaint that you know may be like that. Um, but if you think it's that, then you need to do an investigation because you need to make sure that this person who's made this complaint. Um, you know, someone needs to find out whether or not these allegations are true and whether these allegations are malicious, right? If there's, if they're malicious, well, then there's, that can, you know, that can maybe not bode well for our complainant. So, so we've got five minutes left. So if there's anybody who has any, any questions, now's your time to, to, to put them into chat. Um, I'm happy to keep on talking and, and, and I'm sure Candace has a couple left in her as well, but it, I just encourage anybody to get their last word in if they do want to. And while we're just uh, giving you a chance to think about it, I just want to encourage everyone here um, to, uh, if you don't have a support person, a trusted, you know, a person in your corner, like I, just from that experience that I had, I, I sure, I sure needed support like and you know not to necessarily talk about the details of things but just to make sure that like self care for us. As HR professionals I mean we're, we're taking care of the witnesses we're taking care of the risks to the employer and the risks to the individuals and we're like all this kind of stuff and so I just want to encourage all of you and and I, I think I'm 
I, I think many of us would be uh, so happy to just be a support if you ever just you know need need a peep to to chat with. So, um, so Cheryl, any parting words? People are starting to run to their next things, but any last words from you? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that you brought up a really good point to end on is um, the self care, right? Um, because, you know, like, we're taking stuff on every time we do an investigation, right? And so, um, you know, we've all probably heard of vicarious trauma, which means, you know, that we're taking the trauma that we're seeing in another person and maybe taking it on. So in the, it, you know, to, to be very wary that that can have an effect on us and can have a negative effect. So as I always say to investigators, you know, have a good support person, have a good therapist. <laughs> Yeah, awesome. But it's been this has been really great. I I loved all the questions and um, yeah, it's it's wonderful and you know it's it's so nice to see that people are interested in this. So thank you all for attending and it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much, Cheryl. Really appreciate it and and uh, thanks so much for for everyone again attending. Uh, and uh, we'll look forward to the next one. Uh, we'll we'll post it as we usually do. And remember the HR hacking HR online conference in March. And um, we plan on having another session like this with another uh, guest in, in April. So thanks everybody, enjoy the rest of your Wednesday. Thanks Cheryl.